Michelle. Welcome to Deep Into Sleep. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Very great to have you. Um, I think you are doing something a little bit similar to me in the coaching field. Is that right? Yes. Yes, I think so. Focusing ah. on mental health and <laughs> yeah. Definitely. Great. Yeah. So what got you interested in doing this kind of work? So this work that I do, um, I, I got into through my own lived experience. Um, so I, I think I'll, I'll speak a little bit more about the work that I do, and then it'll make more sense because <laughs> yeah, I've got quite, quite the story. Uh, so the work that I do, um, I, I am a, a certified professional coach, and I, uh, I offer support and strategy to individuals and families who are living with mental health challenges, as well as those moving forward after loss. I also speak publicly um, about um, mental illness, uh, suicide, stigma, and um, you know way, ways that we can be supporting ourselves through that journey. And so the way I got into this work was, um, as I mentioned, my, my lived experience. My husband died by suicide 14 years ago. He had been suffering from severe mental illness at the time. Um, and, um, you know, he, he had a lot of challenges before that and then sadly passed away and the family um, decided because of the fear of the stigma and the shame that, um, that we tell everyone that he died in an accident. And so I kept this secret for almost 11 years wow. and it deeply impacted my own mental health as well. And it was, you know, through doing my own healing work, you know, my, my life got to a point where I said, I just, I can't do this anymore. And so then I moved forward, um, you know, did, did my healing and realized that I wanted to now be a mental health advocate and support people in the way that I knew I needed support at the time, but didn't know who to turn to, didn't know where to go. So, so most of the clients who come to me now know um, know about the experience that I've had. And so that helps them connect with me. You know, they say, you know, this is what I'm going through. You understand. And usually I do. I mean, while we all have different stories, a lot of the emotions are the same. Uh, the struggles are very similar. And um, so for me, it, it feels like a real gift to be then, you know, now be able to pay it forward and help others in the same situation. Yeah, wow, that's quite a lot of experience there. And I'm really amazed by your courage to go through, uh, live through such a tragedy, but you use that as a way, as an opportunity to transform your life in your own healing journey. And now you, you have a deeper understanding of it. And now you are helping a lot of other people to heal. Yes, yes. Yeah, the stigma you mentioned it's so shocking, right? I'm wondering, like, what was your experience to keep such a secret for mm. so long? What were some pressure you got that to stop you from telling what really happened? That's a great question. Um, I grew up um, in a family that um, didn't talk about these things. It's like, you know, inside, inside the home was one way and then outside is a different way where, you know, everything is perfect and everybody looks perfect and nobody has any problems. And then that extended as well out into the community that I lived in and um, that I was a part of where these things are just not talked about. And so when, uh, yeah, and then I married into a family, no surprise, that was very similar to my own, where, you know, these things, you know, we don't talk about sicknesses because, you know, it's, it could be bad luck or whatever it is. So, um, so I, I came from that kind of space and that was sort of the mindset of, we don't talk about these things. When my husband was alive and was diagnosed, um, he felt some shame around it as well. Um, so, you know, for one thing, nobody talks about that, but then he also felt the added shame because, um, a couple of years before he passed away, the, the illness, um, was, was getting worse and he had to stop working and he felt shame that, you know, he couldn't provide for his family. Uh, we had two young children at this point 
And um, so we didn't tell anybody. It was just something that, you know, I don't even know that we even had a conversation about it. It was just one of those things that was understood of, you know, we just don't talk about this. And it's better to just make up stories <laughs> around, you know, what was going on. You know, he, he drove a company um, vehicle for work. And then when he stopped working, we had to give the vehicle back. And so when people would say, oh, we don't see it on the driveway, what's going on? Oh, he got a promotion, so he doesn't need the vehicle now. And you know, so mm -hmm. we, we had a lot of, of stories around that. So then when he passed away, um, you know, I think that, like the initial reaction, um, you know, one of the family members just turned to me and what are we going to tell people? You know, and it, and it was in that moment where, you know, then I started thinking about it and it's like, oh, what are we going to tell people? Because for one thing, I don't know what to tell my children. They were, they were seven and four. I was like, I don't understand how this happens. So how do, how do these kids, how are they going to understand it? Mm -hmm. We never talked about the mental illness before. So now suddenly we're going to come out and say, this is how he died. Like it, it just felt like a lot to be explaining. And then there was also, you know, the, the guilt and the worry that like, did I do something wrong? Did I miss something? Did I do enough? You know, and, and, you know, when you come from a culture that has a lot of shame in it, we often look to blame ourselves. And so in, in that, you know, and this all, this whole conversation happened maybe a couple of hours after he passed away. So there was so much going on that, you know, when they said that, and then, you know, the next sentence was, why don't we say it was an accident? I was very quick to say, okay, because I didn't have the answers. It felt like a lot to process. And I didn't want to, you know, go out and make it public and then think, oh no, maybe this was somehow my fault or deal with what people might think of me. So, so there was a lot of fear around that. And, you know, and it was interesting because, you know, the family were gathering, close friends were gathering and we, we told them, okay, this is, this is what we're going to say. And everybody said, okay. Like, wow. yeah. So, you know, and not that I put the responsibility on anybody to say anything, but it was just, you know, this was how, you know, deep it was in, in the community and, and the culture of just, it was this acceptance of like, oh, okay, we're all going to just have, say this lie. You know, nobody said, well, you know, I don't want to, it's a sickness. Like, you know, we didn't know enough. We didn't do enough. Uh, you know? <laughs> and um, so it, it just, it ended up becoming, that was the story. And then, you know, then it becomes very hard to undo it after it's told. <laughs> right. And it sounds like the whole family all agreed. Everyone was on board to cover yes. this up, to lie to ourselves and gave this story. And that's how people are going to um, remember him somehow. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a, that's a, a very big piece of it. And thank you for bringing that up because you know, I know for me as well, that was one piece of rationalizing it. I, I have a friend, um, you know, who knows somebody that else that died by suicide and always said like, oh, that woman whose husband died by suicide. So not only is that man being identified by the last moment of his life, but now this woman is being identified by the last moment of her husband's life. And so it just felt like, you know, it, it just keeps adding that stigma to it because nobody says, you know, oh, the woman whose husband died by cancer. They, they just, it doesn't come up that way. But suicide there's something about it, you know, it's, it's, you know, I guess the stigma that's related to it, that it just makes it a thing. And I didn't want my husband being remembered that way. Right. And also that's, if that's, we have to worry about how the community view you and your children, yeah. right? After that, yes. there's a lot of things. I definitely sense a lot of fear, a lot of protection of the family, of yourself, of your husband's, um like honor there's just a lot of yeah. things entangled in it wow that's that's such a difficult choice and yeah, then many just layers for years <laughs> yeah and yeah. you mentioned something interesting i was wondering 
other than telling everyone else outside the family, right, how to uh, communicate to the community, to other people, eventually what you decided to communicate with your own children? So I told my kids at that time that he died in an accident. And so they didn't know the truth until a few years ago after I did my healing work. Um, you know, that was, you know, I'll be honest, I don't regret that they did not grow up thinking that, you know, maybe there was something they could have done differently because it took me a long time, <laughs> a lot of therapy and, and, you know, children internalize things. So I don't regret that, but I do regret not being honest. And, you know, the, you know, once you tell a lie, then you have to keep lying and, and building more stories around it to that keep perpetuating it just to keep that, to hold that secret safe. So um, I didn't like who I was becoming and, you know, I, but, you know, and, and so, yeah, I had to, at, at some point, tell my kids the truth. I always wanted to, but I thought I'll do it when they're older, maybe when they're parents and they understand why parents make difficult choices, <laughs> but it, it didn't come to that. So I did tell them, though, when they were teens, when they okay. were teenagers. Yeah. Did they accept it well? Did you have to coach them, uh, support them through this new acceptance of a new truth? They, they did take it very well. I'm very grateful for that because that was a big piece of it too, that, you know, then being afraid of how, okay, after all these years, now, how do I tell them, you know, they're going to feel like their life is a lie. They may never speak to me again. Um, but the good news is none of that was true. They took it very well. They said they wished they had known from the beginning, but they understood why I made the choice that I made. Um, and, you know, I offered them support, um, you know, if, if they needed a therapist, a doctor, you know, whatever it was that, that, you know, they needed for support that was not me. And I also said, I'm here to answer any question that you have. I want full honesty. And so we had many conversations after that. Um, you know, they obviously had a lot of questions and they, they, you know, they knew they had, you know, kids have a sense of these things. They, mm -hmm. they know, like they didn't know that that's how he died. They didn't think that, but they knew there were a lot of things that were unanswered and that they, they didn't know. So, mm -hmm. you know, there was so much mystery there, but um, no, we've, we've had talks and thankfully they are, they're doing great. And, you know, I, I told, when I told them that I wanted to do this kind of work, they were my biggest cheerleaders. They, Aww. you know, and they still are, they're, they're great. <laughs> That's great. I'm so mm -hmm. happy to hear that. You know, when we talk about um, depression, suicidality, a lot of time, you know, I think people focus on the negative part of it and what it is, how, how much it can impact people's life, it can ruin people's life. And I want more focus on the prevention or in mm. the process, the warning signs, the signals, because I think there's something early on ourselves possibly can do to ourselves to help ourselves. And as family members and friends, maybe there's something, if there's more education, people are more aware of this whole topic, there's possibly something we are able to do to a certain level. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, I agree. I think there are Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering for your own experience, um, first, when your husband went through all this, sounds like he really struggled for a while. Did you identify anything is off? Sounds like he possibly not this type would share any feelings with you. He possibly did not reach out for a lot of support from families. And as, as a family member, um, was there anything you sense, like what other family members could have done to mm -hmm. communicate better about this? Yeah, um, I'm trying to think what to answer first. Well, you know, he, he did not, you know, I don't think it was in any of our radars to mm -hmm. start. Um, you know, he died, um, 
before Facebook came out where, you know, I think everybody is so connected to these things, you know, to everything now. So, you know, while yes, there was the internet and, you know, there were things that were available. I don't think we were quite as aware of, of what to look for, what was going on. Yes. You know, with the bipolar disorder, which, you know, for, if your audience doesn't know that that's, you know, going between cycling between um, bouts of depression and bouts of manic behavior. And so he, I think he had some depression, but it was hard to identify. Um, and I know I as well had my own bouts of depression that why I didn't identify either. So I don't know that we saw it and it wasn't quite as severe. And then the manic episodes um, were very, you know, very spread out when it started manifesting. So it was, it's, you know, it might have been like one odd encounter. And then it was like, okay, that was strange. And then he, he would explain it. And then it was like, okay, fine. You know, or he just seemed really, really happy. And then I would be relieved that, okay, he's not down. Mm -hmm. So I didn't see it as this is something that's manic. You know, now looking back, it's like, oh yeah, okay, this makes sense. But his, his, um, his illness also progressed pretty rapidly by the time we caught on that something was up. Mm -hmm. um, he was already um, cycle, like the cycles happen, you know, in shorter periods of time. So he was cycling, going through these cycles pretty quickly and frequently um, by the time we got the diagnosis. And um, I think, you know, I, I mean, he didn't, he didn't want, he didn't talk about it. We didn't really share it with family until he started like till he got the diagnosis and he started medication but even still i the family i know they didn't understand the illness um they didn't do their own research to find out what it was about they you know they heard he was on medication and i think that you know and i and that's definitely a mentality that okay you're taking medication so you'll be fine mm -hmm. and so um you know, they, they really like, even up until he passed away, they, they still, and even afterwards, you know, I, I, you know, remember his mother even saying to me like a, a number of times, like, I don't understand. I talked to him that morning and he was fine. And it was like, no, he wasn't fine. He was so sick, mm -hmm. but you know, but with the older generations, they're thinking, okay, I had a conversation. He might've been smiling or laughing. So he was okay not realizing that, you know, there, there's a lot more going on, you know, outside of that phone conversation and that, you know, there's still an illness happening when somebody looks, looks happy. So, um, so yeah, they, you know, I, I don't think they understood enough to support us in that way. Um, he was seeking treatment. Um, you know, he, he had a psychiatrist and I went for uh, group counseling as well, like for family members. So that for me was, was really a good thing. But again, like, you know, I would go to the meeting, have, you know, cry the whole time <laughs> and, oh. and then leave. And then it was like, okay, now push it down and go on with life. So it was very compartmentalized to, you know, just talk to it with the group, talk, talk about it with the group. Um, and, you know, I had a few friends that, um, that knew, but very small amount of friends. And, you know, again, I don't think any of us fully understood it. Right. Yeah. Sounds like a lot of suppression, a lot of isolation and yeah. your, you, your husband, your children, you all just deal with it within yourself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. With, with the limited knowledge and trying to live through it and go as like leave as you go and try to cope with it as you go. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I mean, for me, um, when my husband stopped working, I had, I took on an extra job. So I was working two jobs and I had small children. Um, you know, when he stopped working, my younger son was about 18 months and my older one was three. So 
I was just, you know, on autopilot and, and I'm sure many women can relate to that feeling where you know, right. it's just put one foot in front of the other, do what you need to do, do your job, take care of the kids, make the mm -hmm. meals and, and then tomorrow's a new day. And, and that's really how I was living. Like there was no, what about me? You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> it didn't, it, I, I didn't create any space for that. It didn't feel like there was room for that. That's such an important point, I think. I think a lot of people, when we had a lot to struggle through, a lot of challenges in life, we, all we can think about it is how to survive through this. Our survival mode is on, right? How to get by today, next day, just keep on going. And definitely autopilot, not think about what we need. Do we need self-care? And you mentioned eventually all this happened in the process. A lot was on your shoulder mm -hmm. and you were depressed yourself. So how, at what moment did you finally realize, oh, like I did, I need to do something for myself. This, I, my state yeah. is not right. Uh, yeah, that was, that happened. Um, I get, well, yeah, it was about 10 years later. Wow. And yeah, yeah. I just, I just kept going, um, you know, and, and it's interesting because, you know, I had had other relationships and, um, you know, they were not healthy because obviously I was not healthy myself, you know, keeping this huge secret. I didn't grieve properly. And um, finally, it was, it was around the time I turned 45. And I was in a relationship that was very unhealthy and, um, and in, a, in a job that I was not happy in. And I realized like I am in so much pain. And I realized too that a lot, that it was, it was up to me to change it. That it was because of, you know, the way I grew up with the shame and then, you know, carrying it throughout that I needed to do my work before my life was going to get better. It wasn't up to anybody else. And so that's when I made the commitment to myself that I'm going to, I'm going to do the healing work. And, and I did, I did a very deep dive and, and finally just, you know, realized, okay, this is, this is not, you know, not my shame to carry and not even it, you know, it was even overcoming the shame of, you know what, there's nothing to be ashamed of if your husband dies by suicide, there's nothing to be ashamed of if we have a mental health challenge. And, and really accepting all of that was what then enabled me to have that conversation with my children because I wasn't ashamed of that anymore. So, you know, it, it really, but, but I, I hit, you know, a bottom, you know, I say like I had a few rock bottoms in my life, but that, you know, that was a turning point for me of realizing there has to be a better way. Mm. Yeah, I really like it. It's very powerful to go through all this and face the shame, which is a very powerful thing, and uh, really face it, live with it in a very different way, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and get over with it. That needs a lot of courage, and definitely, um, I'm sure your healing was so helpful that you are able to look at that and recognize it and know what to do with it. Now look back, we know when we were depressed, there's so many different symptoms. There are so many yeah. signals, right? Um, normally, very commonly, people can be socially isolated, feel really sad, uh, lose hope. There are a lot of appetite change, weight yeah. change, sleep change, motivation change. There's so many different signals. What yeah. was that like for you? Now you look back. Yeah. So for me, it's very interesting because what I know about my own depression is that I don't go into the, um, the hopelessness and the negative thoughts. For me, it manifests in sleeping a lot. And that's actually what, what got me to, to finally see a doctor about it. So for me, I sleep a lot. I'm always tired. And it's like, it's a body tired. Like my body just feels like, like, you know, it's, it's a dead weight. 
and um, like it's a very heavy feeling. And I also can't feel emotions. So I kind I shut off. And so for me, I see now, you know, that's just how I was surviving. And I just didn't realize it, but knowing who I am, I'm a, a highly sensitive person. So, you know, it, after I had started doing the healing, when I had the next episode come up, I went to my doctor and I said, I don't think this is normal. Like, you know, I, I you know, and, and she, she knew the, everything I had been doing all this time, um, you know, with the, with the secrets and then exposing it all. But I just, you know, and this was at a point I had left that job that I wasn't happy in and I had started coaching and I said, I am sleeping 15 hours a day. Wow. You know, yeah, I would sleep 12 hours at night and then nap for three hours in the afternoon. And so that's where I finally went to the doctor because I said, I'm, a, I'm an entrepreneur. I can't afford to sleep as much as I'm sleeping. And I said, and I'm noticing also I'm not feeling, I'm feeling detached. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, it's, it was almost as though, you know, life was happening and I was watching it like it was a movie, but I wasn't connected. So she said, yeah, sounds like, sounds like it's depression. And she put me on medication and, um, and the medication worked, but I also realized that, that I needed more than just the medication because, you know, it, it was a lot of things in my lifestyle that I, I needed to shift. And that once I started shifting, I realized, okay, I'm starting to feel like me again. You know, because I, I lost a lot of those parts of myself and, you know, who I was and what I love and, um, you know, just recognizing now that, you know, it, it is, it's a whole lifestyle change. Mm, amazing. Wow. Sleeping 15 hours per day. <laughs> that definitely is a lot. Yes. <laughs> Take a big part of your daily life away from you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. So of course that makes you feel even more disconnected and that, you know, it just, it's a snowball effect. Yeah. I know a lot of people, when we are depressed, we use sleep for some people, you sleep as a way to avoid, to mm. numb self, to run away from things. So we don't feel things. We don't need to think about things. We don't have to experience things. But for you, sounds like it was more subconsciously. You are not um, yeah. purposely sleeping yeah. in order to not think, not feel. No, no. I, it was, it was this uncontrollable exhaustion where it was just like, I, I would be sitting in this conversation and suddenly I would feel this heaviness and, and I would have to, you know, say I, I've got to go and I would lie down and I would be out in a minute. Wow. Like, yeah, it was, it was really quite debilitating now that, you know, I look back on it. Right. Was that, uh, when you realize that, when you eventually, this is alarming enough to you, I'm so happy you go, went to see a doctor. Mm -hmm. I'm curious afterwards, after you were on medication, what are some things you have done? Sounds like you did a lot of great things to rebuild yeah. your life. Uh, yeah. I want to know what like eventually help you get rid of this long, and mm. refreshing sleep yeah. and eventually rebuild a more positive, healthy lifestyle to who you are today. You look amazing now. Thank you. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, I feel amazing. Um, yeah, so I mean, the medication was great in the sense that it got me to stop sleeping as much. So, you know, I don't, I'm not against medication when we need to take it. Um, I was, though, able to go off the medication after a number of months um, because, uh, because of all the other changes that I, I had made. So, you know, one thing that's, that was very important was, was shifting my mindset. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the work that I was doing of just, you know, recognizing for one thing, you know, I mean, gratitude, all the positive things, which are wonderful. But again, that didn't help with the sleep. But recognizing too, that I don't need to make myself wrong for being tired or for how I was feeling, that that only makes it worse when I'm like, oh no, here I go again, of just accepting it. And this is, this is something that I still, you know, will, will use when I notice that like, oh, okay, I'm noticing that feeling happening to me. And I say, okay, that's a signal from my body that I need to rest. 
and I will accept it. And so, and, and that for me, like my self care routine has, you know, I call myself the queen of self care now because really oh. like there are no, no excuses. I do not push my, I don't push myself harder than what I know my limits to be. Um, so if I'm feeling that my body is giving me that signal, I listen to it. Um, as well, um, having a regular sleep schedule, getting, you know, I've always needed eight hours, eight to nine hours. So I honor that now. I used to not sleep enough. So it was hard to even tell, like, am I tired because I'm depressed or I'm tired because I didn't sleep well? And also, if I don't get enough sleep the next day, I know it's never a good day. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. just, and so that I can put it into perspective now of, you know, when I'm feeling down, it's like, oh, yeah, well, I only slept maybe six hours. That explains it. And then maybe I'm going to make time in my day for a nap. But give myself what I need. But I, I try to really prevent it. So I go to sleep earlier. I'm pretty strict about my, my sleep routine. Um, I exercise regularly. Um, you know, I, I do have a workout routine and it's not long, but it, it might be 15 or 20 minutes. I, I put on, you know, a YouTube video because now, now my gym is still closed, but I'll go on YouTube. There's so many different workouts that we can do. Mm -hmm. um, so, so exercising, going outside, um, you know, I, try to get out whenever I can. I just took an, I, I realized I had a one hour break <laughs> in between clients because somebody canceled. So I went for a walk for an hour cool. and yeah, just getting the fresh air. My diet, changing my diet um, was, was huge of just paying attention to how I felt after I ate certain foods. So for me, um, dairy makes me feel very sluggish. And so I stopped eating dairy or, you know, and not even stopped, but I, I really, I reduced it greatly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know, I'm, I'm down to maybe 10% of the dairy that I was eating before uh, and not every day um, for me as well. Carbs, carbs, you know, I get the, the hot, the rush and then I crash. Oh. So I'm on a low carb diet. So just, you know, and I've added way more green vegetables. Now I do green juices, which give me energy. So just that shift, but also it's the idea of knowing that I'm doing all these things for me, that I feel good about it. Like when I'm making the green juice, it's like, I know this is something nourishing for me. So I, you know, I'm, I'm definitely, you know, I'm happy that I'm doing it and I'm feeling better because I'm giving myself that support. Um, you know, I, that's something, you know, we talk about the isolation. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I have a wonderful support group right now. And, you know, while we can't always physically be with each other, now we have Zoom, we have so many different online platforms or a phone call. And so, and I'm not afraid to reach out. If I'm having a down day, I, I will reach out to the people that I trust that I know can be there for me. And, um, you know, and I, and I want to say too, because we were, you know, talking about just, you know, my background and who, you know, how I grew up and a piece of that with the supports, a, a big piece of the learning for me was recognizing that I had to be careful who I chose to look to for support. Because when we reach out to somebody who has their own, you know, shame or stigma around mental health, they can't support us in the way that somebody else can, who doesn't have that same kind of shame or stigma. Um, you know, so, so really choosing who I'm reaching out to, who I know can support me. You know, I, I think about there, I had a friend, um, you know, after my husband passed away who had also lost a spouse and anytime I, you know, I thought, okay, this is a good support person, but anytime I would reach out to him, he would just say, oh, suck it up. It's life. Oh. <laughs> and so it's like, you know, that didn't help me, but just, you know, and, and that was his coping mechanism, mm -hmm. but just knowing like, that's not, that was not the support I needed. I just needed somebody to listen to me and, and talk about, you know, how hard it was for me that he was gone and that now I'm raising one of my children alone. And so just knowing that, you know, you, we have to choose the friends who can listen, who can be there for us. 
And, you know, because then we don't feel even worse afterwards, because that's, you know, that's what would happen to me with, with this friend and, you know, and other people too, that I would reach out, they couldn't give me what, what I needed. And then I felt worse afterwards. So yeah. I think there's, there's something that has to be said about that. Yeah, that's so important. I think I'm sure a lot of people are struggling with that is how to find the right support. Mm -hmm. uh, because I know and I'm not surprised if someone decide, okay, I'm gonna step out of my comfort zone, reach out for help and for support, then someone um, answered or respond in such invalidating way kind of like reinforce suppressing your feelings, yeah. right? There's no need to be this, why you cannot let it go. And some people may just stop reaching out and that's yeah. gonna be so sad. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I, I did create a network, a, a new network of people that were able to be supportive. And, you know, and I'd say like, you know, as many issues that we have with social media today, because that's not all good. <laughs> one good thing, one positive thing that though that has come out of it is that there are a lot of support groups on Facebook, online, particularly now with the pandemic. Um, so there are people out there that, you know, if anybody that's listening today is, is feeling alone, you know, it's so much easier now to find people. There are groups with wonderful people in it. Um, you know, and, and I've joined a few of those groups and somebody will just say, you know, I'm struggling today. And then 50 people will say, I'm here, send me a private message. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, there are professionals like myself, if people want one-on-one -on -one counseling, but it's so much more accessible now. And so, you know, I, I really strongly encourage that if, if people are feeling isolated, reach out to people that you don't know yet, because they may end up becoming your lifeline and your closest friends. And I know that was my experience. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, if you, you have any group you create or you know mm -hmm. any, I'm happy to put those links or, uh, you know, any good support group in the show notes for people to at sure. least have a place to get started. Yeah. And I think one thing you mentioned gets me think is sometimes we reach out for support. We really are not looking for an answer or problem solving, right? Uh, yes. <laughs> a, a lot of time we really just need someone to listen. And yeah. even though they may not fully understand, but they are willing to, to acknowledge yeah. how we are feeling. That's so, yeah. so important. It is so important. And, and it's interesting you bring that up because that's something that when I coach the family members of people with severe mental illness, you know, they, they say like, what should I do? And I say, the first thing you do when they're reaching out to you is ask them what they need. Do you want me to just listen or do you want me to help you find a solution? And, and people are always shocked at that because we don't think like we automatically, that's our default is we want to fix it you know, and make, make them feel better. And, and that's often not what they need. So that's the first thing I say is, is just ask them. And, and that as family members or as friends, our role is just to love that person. And, you know, sometimes it's hard for us, like we know there's the illness and that's what we see, you know, we're seeing it through the lens of the illness, but they're still the same person they always were and the person that we love. And so, yeah, the, the best thing we can do is to love them and, and not try to fix it unless they're saying, I need help. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great because I was just about to ask you any suggestions to family members, friends who really yeah. care, but somehow don't know what to do or yeah. when they say something, yeah. make, make the person feel worse. And that's yeah. a great suggestion. Yeah, Thank to you. ask for the permission, ask for the need before we say anything. Oh, you should do this. Maybe you can try that before we jump to that, right? Yeah. Listen yeah. first and ask first. Yeah. And I think too, um, another um, recommendation I have, particularly now, I mean, depending where in the world we are and what city we're in, sometimes city country, you know, with the pandemic, if you're concerned about somebody, just reach out and check up on them. And, you know, there's, there's, you know, sometimes like, I think we, we often see vulnerability as a weakness, but it's actually a strength. And, 
so if you're not sure what to say, then say that, you know, but, but, you know, just think about what, you know, if you were struggling and one of your friends reached out and said, listen, I, I know you're having a hard time and I don't know what to say, but I want you to know I'm here for you and I can just listen you know, think about how, you know, I would be like, yes, please. Like nobody's going to take that the wrong way. So, and, and it's okay for you to say, I don't know what to say, or I don't know what to do, but I am here. You know, that, that is so appreciated. So don't feel like you need to know the exact words. Just be honest because really, you know, the, your loved one who you want, who you want to help is feeling very vulnerable too. So you're actually meeting them in the same level of vulnerability. And that is creating a much deeper com, you know, connection when you're saying, I'm, I'm here no matter what, because I care about you. And you know, that, that's it, but I don't know the rest, <laughs> but I'm willing to learn. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I, I love that. That the, the way of saying that is so genuine and yeah. so helpful actually. It's, it's a truth, absolutely truth, but it's, it's so powerful to hear. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, great. These are a lot of great information. And um, so I want to know if, you know, near the end of our show, if anyone's listening and they either worry about someone they love or themselves or struggling through some, uh, emotional challenges. What are some of your final wisdom to them, mm. to whoever is listening? Right yeah. Now? So, so I, I'd say like the first step, I think if you are not feeling well, or if you're concerned about somebody else, go to your doctor and get a physical. Um, because often there are um, vitamin deficiencies, hormone imbalances, different things that can actually be happening in our bodies where the symptoms may seem like depression or seem like anxiety, but there's something else happening. So go get checked out, get your blood work done, get other things ruled out. Your doctor is trained to know if, if it might be a mental health challenge. Um, so, so leave it to them. And, and as well, if you have a loved one that you're concerned about, you can just say the same thing. You don't have to say, I think you have depression because sometimes when you say that, you know, people go, Oh, you know, they get defensive because of the stigma and we don't know we're, we're not qualified to, to do that, but you can just say, I'm noticing that you're not yourself lately. Can you go to your doctor to get checked out? And you can offer to go with them if that's, you know, something that's possible. But the, I think the first place is with, with the doctor. Um, you know, if it's somebody who has a diagnosis, I just mentioned, you know, different ways to reach out. And, you know, if you are concerned that somebody you love is suicidal, trust your gut, you know, it, take them, take them to the hospital, call 911, whatever it is, don't dismiss it. Um, because we don't know, we have no way of knowing. Um, but I, I have done um, suicide prevention training. And so they say that, you know, if you're concerned to ask the person, are you thinking about, are you considering suicide? And if they say yes, you can ask them, do you have a plan? Um, many people are afraid of doing that because they think that that might give the person the idea. It won't, but it'll give you an, an idea. If they say, yes, I have a plan then you, we, you know, you need to get them help quickly. So, um, but, but really trust your intuition. You know, if you're wrong and they're not suicidal, you're getting them into a place that that's helpful and, you know, and, and a place that can help them. And I think, you know, it, it never hurts, um, you know, to, to be cautious when we have that kind of concern, because usually there's something and we may not be able to put our finger on it, but, you know, if, if you're worried, there, there may be a reason to worry. And I can tell you, like, from my experience, my husband never talked about suicide. He never said, I want to die. He never said anything like that. And um, so, you know, there are often not, there aren't ways to prevent it. Um, but I did, you know, I did have him in a hospital. I put him in a hospital a couple of weeks earlier because I was actually, I was worried he might accidentally hurt himself. Mm. But um, you know, it's, so that's the thing that like, 
we usually can sense when something is really wrong. So, so just follow, follow that feeling and do what you feel is, is, is necessary. Definitely. Yeah. To be safe. You don't want to be sorry. And right. Just do whatever you can. Right. And yeah. sounds like you definitely did a lot. You tried a lot. You tried your best. Yeah. Yeah. Back then with that like level of knowledge of what's yeah. going on. Yeah. Great. So if a lot of listeners are very interested in uh, what you do and if they really like what you shared, want to find you to get your support, your help, how, how can they find you? Uh, the best way to find me is, um, well, everywhere online. <laughs> I have a website, which is michellenhangcoaching.com. And um, you can find me all over social media as well with Michelle Anhang Coaching. So pretty much every platform <laughs> you, you can find me. Not TikTok. My kids won't let me go on TikTok. But, <laughs> but I'm on Instagram. I'm on Twitter. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm where else is there? I, I don't even Facebook. So yeah, lots of ways to reach me. Um, and I also um, want to mention I offer a mindfulness for mental health course um, mindfulness has been a big part of my healing, uh, making the mind body connection, just really being able to slow myself down when I need to. Um, and many people, um, have this idea that, you know, mindfulness means meditating for 20 minutes or half an hour or an hour. And it doesn't, there are very quick, quick exercises that we can do that are mindful that we can ground ourselves and center ourselves. And that's, and I teach that to people who um, maybe have tried meditating and it doesn't work, but it really helps us with our emotion regulation and, and becoming aware of what our body is telling us. So you can find information about that on my website as well. Great, great resources. All this sounds very helpful. And I totally agree. Mindfulness can be such an important tool. And especially I know for a crisis moment, we sometimes really help people, teach people ahead of time how to get grounded. Yeah. And so interesting when you mention mind-body connection, because my own clinic called Mind-Body Garden Psychology, oh. <laughs> I totally advocate for <laughs> mind-body connection. I think that's very yeah. important. Yeah, I mean, for me, learning the signals that my body gives me before I go into an episode, you know, I can catch it so early on because I have that connection. And then I know, okay, time to increase my self care. And I, I, since I started doing this work, I have not had a bad episode. I can usually catch it and prevent it. You know, it might be something mild, but you know, then I'm taking the naps, I'm doing what I'm needing to do, I've got the support around me. So if it got worse, then I'm feeling bad. And, and all of these little things, even just knowing that we have the support available, sometimes keeps us from going into a, a deeper episode than we might. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Well, love all these things you shared. I will put all your like website, whatever, uh, social media and platform in the show notes. Just make it easier for the audience. Thank wonderful. you so much, Michelle, for coming to the show and sharing all this wonderful experience and your own healing journey, what you learned with us all. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thank you. Bye.